I want to back up to the beginning of Fit 16. Oh, before I do that, check your email Wednesday night just to make sure we're not going to have class Thursday. Um, I'm having surgery on my hand Thursday morning. They were supposed to try to schedule it for Thursday afternoon, and they called and said it's scheduled for 6 a.m. Thursday morning. Um, but often, I've had multiple surgeries over the last few years on my joints. Um, often what happens is they'll call the day before, like late in the afternoon, and say, you know, come instead at a different time. If that happens, and we will have class on Thursday, I will let you know via D2L email Wednesday. Or if they call today, I'll put it up on D2L. So, so then would we have a test Thursday? No, no, no. You're not having a test on Thursday, don't, because we're not going to finish Beowulf today. Okay. okay. Yeah, there's no way we're finishing Beowulf today. We'll um, what we'll have instead is I will put um, up, I'll put online a, or a link to a lecture that will cover, hopefully, several hundred lines, if not a thousand. Um, for you to watch on Thursday, and then we'll finish Beowulf on, we're going to try to finish Beowulf on um, Tuesday the 2nd. It's two days essentially behind schedule. We'll be able to kind of, we'll probably be able to catch up. Uh, like the next day after, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm backing this up for a moment to the Finsburg um, episode. And the show up in the hall sings the Finsburg episode, or the story about what happens at Finsburg, kind of as part of the celebration of Beowulf having killed Grindel. So we get, you know, Beowulf killed Grindel. There's his arm hanging up to the ceiling, probably still has a bit of stuff dripping from it, you know, onto the floor. Um, and the poet comes in and pulls out his heart and sings this song about the sons of Finn surprised in ambush when the hero of the half and half the shielding had to fall in a Frisian slaughter. Okay? And you got a long footnote about this. And how Hildebert indeed had no need to praise the good faith of the Jutes. The Jutes there is another name for the Frisians. Okay. She was deprived of her dear ones in that shield play, her sons and brothers. Why? Because here's Hildebert. She marries Finn. Finn's the son of Fulkwalda. They're Frisians. They're Shieldings. They're at war. Okay. So her father marries her off to his son. Why? To bring peace between these two warring tribes, okay? They get married, they have a son, the son is not named. And here's what happened, happens in the story. So Hildur goes off to live with Finn in the land of the Frisians, and she gets lonely, or she misses her family, whatever the cause, and her brother Knaf, with a bunch of his retainers, comes and visits. And the Frisians attack them while they are visiting. Okay? This violates a very, very old law or practice of hospitality. Of hospitality. This notion of hospitality is Indo-European in origin. That is, it goes back to the very small group of people who gave rise to all the groups of people that today speak what are called the Indo-European languages. So it goes back to roughly anywhere from 5,000 to 7,000 BC. Small group of people that later break off and they give us the Indian speaking languages. You know, these kind of Indian, not Native American, okay? The Slavic languages, all the languages of Europe, with the exception of Finnish and Hungarian and Basque, okay? But all the Italic languages, the Celtic languages, the Germanic languages, okay? So think, you know, go all, all the way across Russia. 
and in almost all of Europe, down into India, all those people ultimately came from a small group of people, probably somewhere either in eastern Turkey or in the north of the Caucasus Mountains between the Black and Caspian Sea. Take my history and English language course next fall, next spring, and we'll get into this. It's a lot. It's really, really cool. Okay. All of these people have this notion of hospitality. How do we know? Because it shows up in all of the folklore. It shows up in all of the myths. Somebody comes knocking at your door in the middle of the night, you are bound by this custom to let them in. Even if it turns out to be your dreaded enemy. And when that person is welcome into your home, you then protect them and their people. So Finn has an obligation to protect, to Finn. And Finn and his men don't. They attack. Okay. So what do we hear happen? 1095. So you have this battle, and, and what happens in the battle? Her son, Hildebert's son, and her brother die in the battle. And the implication is they die killing each other. Okay, Another little bit you need to understand. So his relationship is what to Knaf? Nephew. Ne okay. Use Tolkienian language if you're familiar with Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Tolkien, in the, in the people of Rowan, they refer to uncle or aunt as father's brother's son, mother's brother's son. Okay. He is what? Sister's son. In Germanic? Apparently, because of the literature, that's about the closest tie you can have. It's not father's son. It's sister's son. Why? Because that sister's son would often be fostered at the uncle's house. Okay? Raised like a foster son. What purpose? To train that person up how to be a warrior. Okay, So this relationship is the closest. And what do they do? They apparently kill each other. An example of? Kinslaying. Okay. Notice, we've just had a kinslayer Grindel because he descends from Cain, killed by Beowulf, who is sitting at the feet of Hrothgar, Unferth, whom Beowulf accuses of kinslaying. And what is the poet? This is, you know, like the press secretary of Herod do. Sings a song about kinslaying. Okay? So, the remainers, because he's dead now, and he's dead now, do what? Finn and Hengist, who is Knaf's right-hand man, kind of swear a peace treaty. What's the peace treaty? Here's the hall. And if you've grown up in a house with a lot of kids in a small house, you might have had to do this at one point in your life. And what do they do? They break up. They essentially draw a line across the middle. Or as my Brother and I did every now and then hang sheets as a barrier. You know, this is my half of the room, this is your half of the room. Yeah, but you have the half that has the door that leads out. That's not, you know. So, they swear this piece, page 10, uh, line 1095. They swore their pledges, pledges in on either side, a firm compact of peace. With unfeigned zeal, Finn swore his oath to hang his pledge that he, with the consent of his counselors, would support them, blah, 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 blah. Hengus said his man, they're okay with that for a certain time. Why? What time of year is it? It's winter when this happens. When they left to go visit Hildebert at Finn's place, how did they go? Horseback? No. By boat. It's winter. The rivers are frozen. They can't leave. So they have to stay there for the winter. 
And when the winter thaw starts to come, when spring starts to come, we're told. Uh, line 1136. Gone was the winter. And fear of the bosom of earth, the exile burned to take leave of that court. Yet more he thought of stern vengeance. That is, he really wants to leave. Hengus really wants to leave. But even more than that, he wants vengeance. Why? Fourfold Germanic ethic. Duty to one's lord, duty to one's kin, duty to avenge one's lord and kin. How he might arrange a hostile meeting. Remind the Jewish sons of his own sword. Now here's one of the interesting things about this story. Hengist is a character that's actually named in Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English People. He is named as one of the people who come, one of the Germanic people, who comes over when the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes invade England. It's he and his brother. His brother's name's Horsa. Both names mean stallion, stud men, you know, in other words. They right? chased them to England. Well, no, not necessarily. That's not what Bede says. The reason it's interesting is because we have this name here, and we have the same name show up in Bede. We don't see it anywhere else. So scholars have said, hmm, could this be? Because we know... When the Angles, Angles, Saxons, and the Jutes came to England, if you look at that map of Northern Europe in the back of your book, they didn't just come from over here in Germany, you know, take a boat right in the coast, go straight across the North Sea. They hopscotched them, we now think, across the Northern European coast, and then jumped across the channel. All right? Frisia... The Frisians. We still have the Frisian islands off the coast. Frisian, old Frisian, is the closest Germanic language to Old English. If you can read Old English, you can make your way through Old Frisian. Indicating it's, you know, the, the language that became Old English isn't quote unquote pure Angle speak from the land of the Angles, or a Saxon from the land of the Saxons. It's closer to this, okay? So, what happens? Hengus breaks the oath and delivers a can of you-know-what on the Frisians. How badly? They're all gone. They're wiped out, okay? At least within the little... Um, fortress of Finnsburg, Finn's castle. Everybody there is wiped out. There are other Frisians because they're going to come up later on in the in the poem. Okay, so we get to the end of that, and what what do we see? Hengist brings Hildebrand back to the land of the Shildings. And Hildebrand's like, "Way to go, Hengist! You avenge my brother, right?" Hmm. Let's see. We're told um, the shielding bowmen carried to their ships all the house property of that earth king, whatever they could find of hence. Homestead, breaches, and bright gems on their sea journey. They bore the noble queen back to the Danes and led her to her people. The lay was sung, the entertainer song. We're not really told how Hildebert thinks of all this. Okay? And then Wealthy out comes out. And we're told, 1162, Wealthel, remember what her name means, servant of exile, servant of Wales, if you want, but it doesn't mean Wales, it means exile, foreign, or foreign servant, if you want. What's another way of putting foreign servant? Slave. <laughs> so, Wealthel came forth in her golden crown to wear the good two set. Who are the good two? Well, we're, to we're told. Nephew and uncle. So let's replace this hall with Rothgar's, with Rothgar's hall. Make it bigger. 
So here's Hrothgar. Okay. Where's Hrothulf? More than likely, he's sitting on his right side. Okay. Their peace was, what's the next word that Lisa gives us? Then. Still hold in. What does the still mean? It's not always going to be. Okay. Each true to the other. Likewise, Uther is sitting right there. Notice this nice little kind of inverted pyramid shape where you've got these three individuals. All right? Sat at the foot of the shielding Lord. Everyone trusted his spirit. And yet, what did Beowulf say about Unferth? He killed his brother. That he had great courage. How much courage does it take to kill one's brother? Though to his kinsmen... Now, who is speaking here? It's nobody within the world of the poem. This is the narrator of the poem. This is the show in whatever time the poem is composed. Is singing this. Okay? And the show says, though to his kinsmen he had not been merciful in swordplay. The show is bringing, raising to our attention. These two are yet true to each other. He wasn't true to his kinsmen. He sits at Hrothgar's feet. He represents Hrothgar. What's the poet trying to tell us? The poet, the person who composed the whole poem, who wrote the poem, possibly. What does Hamlet, Hamlet famously say? Something's rotten in Denmark. There's a problem with this picture. If you have a kinslayer sitting where? At the Lord's feet. What does that kind of represent? At the heart of the kingdom. And it's corrupt. Yeah, no, there's a civil not, war. It's not that it's corrupt necessarily. There's a civil war in its future. But kinslaying will occur. It is saying, well, let me go back and say, okay, let's use corrupt. Let's use another kind of form of language. I don't know if you've had the 3,000 course, whatever the course is, where you're supposed to read a bunch of um, literary theory crap, in my opinion. Apply the notion of deconstruction to this. This is what? Unferth is the loose thread. <laughs> Just pull on that thread a little bit, and the whole thing falls apart. So, we have that image. The poet brings Unferth's kinslaying to her mind. Then the lady of the shielding spoke. And she says, Take this cup, my noble, courteous lord, giver of treasure. Who's she talking to? Her husband. Okay. Be truly joyful, gold friend of men. And speak to the geats in mild words, as a man should do. Why, why in mild words? Why not in praiseworthy words? She's just saying, speak to them mildly. Why? We don't know it yet, but we're going to find out. I've mentioned this before. When Beowulf lands on shielding soil, the geats and the shieldings have been in a cold war. It hasn't been hot fighting but they're not on good terms. So, speak to them kindly. Be gracious to the geats, mindful of the gifts which you now have from near and far. So, be gracious, be mindful of gifts means give. Be generous in your gift giving. I've been told that you would take this warrior, and she points to Beowulf. Sitting across from Hrothgar, here's Hrethric and Hrothmund sitting on either side of him. She says, I've been told that you would take this warrior for your son. 
Well, who told her that? Probably everybody who heard Rothgar say, where he say it? Lost my place. Where he said, you know, essentially I will take you as a son. Okay. Herod is cleansed. Grendel's dead. It's been washed out. The bright ring hall. Use your many rewards while you can. That is, all your wealth. Use it while you can. And leave to your kinsmen the folk and kingdom. Who are his kinsmen? All the Danes or Shildings? His sons. Leave to your sons what? The people and the kingdom. What is she implying? Okay, it could be that. What else? Don't, don't usurp your heirs to Beowulf. Don't leave it to Beowulf. She is saying, give Beowulf treasure. Right? I mean, he solved a big problem. But don't do what to Beowulf? Hey, treat. Hey. Exactly. Don't treat him as an heir. Because obviously he's bigger and older than these two. If he's going to treat him as an heir, as a son, logic would say, well, he ought to be next in line then. When you must go forth to face the maker's decree. That's a nice phrase, nice euphemism for die. <laughs> die how? Fate. I know, and then she addresses... Grovels, where she's still talking to Hrothgar. I know that my own dear gracious Hrothgar will hold and honors these youths, Hrethric Hrothland, if you should give up the world before him, friend of the Shieldings. I expect that he would wish to repay both our sons kindly, if he recalls all the pleasures and honors that we have shown him in our kindness since he was a child. The implication is Hrothgar is their why. To teach his sons no nope. reward. He was fostered. That is, he's at his uncle's house. And he's been there since he was a young boy. He's been trained into how to be a warrior and such. And while he is there, Wealthy Al then has two sons. Notice, they're the ones in line to the kingship. Not Rolf. Okay. Why did she deliver this speech? Specifically the lines about Rolf? Because Rolf uh, may have, like, you know, usurped the kingdom. You said may have. He's being treated like an heir. Possibly. But I don't think so, because he hasn't, we haven't heard that described. Notice her language. I know that my own dear, gracious Hrothulf. What kind of language is that? She's buttering him up. Okay. Is she buttering him up? Is this flattery? Or is it being sarcastic? Or is it sarcastic? My own dear, gracious Hrothulf. Well, what? Well, hold in honors these youths. That is, he will respect these youths. What's the next word? If. What does if always imply? When? Nope. Condition. It's a conditional. A conditional is always subjunctive. That is, it's a condition contrary to fact. If I win the lottery, I will be a millionaire. How's that a condition contrary to fact? Because you have to win the water. Right? Yeah, because I haven't yet. <laughs> if I am nominated president, I will serve. Big condition contrary to fact. Okay. If, fill in the condition, and the condition is always, you don't say, you know, something like, for me, 
if I were a straight white man, why? Because I am a straight white man. But if I were to say, if I were a gay Asian man, that's a condition contrary to fact. Notice, what kind of conditional is that? That is one that will always be a conditional. Because while I could become gay, I could never become Asian. There is no way that that could happen. Okay? I mean, you may have caucuses in you, and that's Asian. No, caucuses isn't Asian. Isn't Asian. If you should give up the world before him, that's the condition. If you, Hrothgar, die before Hrothos, he's older, he'll do what? Respect your children. I expect that he would wish to repay both our sons' kindness. I expect. Is an expectation necessarily something that is going to happen? No. If, again, another conditional, he recalls all the pleasures and honors that we have shown him. She's saying, we have essentially spoiled him. And if he remembers all those, and if he remembers how we've treated him, etc., then he will do these things. But what if he doesn't remember them? What if he chooses not to remember them? Well, then there's problems. Okay. And she turned to the bench where her boy sat, Red Rickman Hoffman, and the son of heroes. Who's the son of heroes? Beowulf. That's the big B. <laughs> All the youths together, the good man, Beowulf the Geat, sat between the two brothers. Why does the poet, it's not wealthy, I'll emphasize that, why does the poet emphasize that? Because he's being treated like as if he's a son, right? Okay, possibly. Maybe she expects the poet suggesting that Rothgar's uh, endowment of gifts will ensure her son's protection against. Rothgar. Endowment of gifts to whom? Beowulf. Beowulf? Okay. Possibly. He's she is going to say something. He's obliged. He's almost splitting the house. Maybe. Beowulf? Or a foreshadowing. How do you mean? You mean between the two brothers? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. It's possible. What's, it up? What's a possibility? Trevor's come close to it. Might she really be addressing Hrothulf or Hrothgar? Might she be addressing somebody else? The big guy with the bulging muscles sitting between the two twerps? <laughs> Might she be suggesting Beowulf something about him. Just hold that idea. Okay? So, fit 18. She then brings out her own treasure. And the greatest net collar, line 1195, ever heard of anywhere on earth. Net collar. We would call it probably, use the Celtic, a torque, okay? Piece of woven, braided, gold fibers, strings, many of them, probably scores, if not hundreds, of little gold strings that have been braided, and they might have a big knot, like a Celtic knot, on either end. And this thing, because it's braided and it's fibers, it can be opened and closed, okay? So you put it around your neck, and you close it like a bangle that you put around your wrist that doesn't fit over your hand, but you can open a little bit, put it, and close it. She brings this out and gives it to Beowulf. And we're told, I've never heard tell of a better toward treasure of heroes since Hama carried off to the bright city the Brazingan necklace, the gem and its treasures. He fled the treachery of Ermenric. The Brazingan necklace, footnote, had apparently been worn by the Norse goddess Freya. That's what we know from Norse sources, but it's not clear. So the poet is alluding to something that for us isn't clear. But the very fact that the poet is alluding to it means the audience had to understand that. Okay. So the audience hears 
Hama, brushing a necklace. Oh, yeah, I get it. It's like we would hear, well, back when history used to be taught, I don't know, maybe you don't know who this is. Been in the colonel. Next word. Traitor. <laughs> See, that's what I mean. <laughs> They would have understand all the references, understood all the references to all the people named in the story, in the poem. Whereas we don't. He fled the treachery of Ermenric, chose eternal counsel. Ermenric, bad king, okay, famous king of the Goths. And then the poet gives us our first reference to Freelac, <laughs> Freelac, Hishi and Ray, to Helax. Frisian raid. This is the first one. There will be three within the poem. Indicating this is important to the poet. He comes back to this again and again and again. Okay? Well, what happens on this Frisian raid? He elect the gate on his last journey. Okay, if it's last, then what happens? He dies. Yeah, he dies. Had that neck ring. The nephew of Swerting. When under the banner, he defended his booty as full as a slaughter. Fate struck him down. When in his pride, he went looking for woe, a feud with the Frisians. Notice, he started this feud. He opened it up. Okay? He wore that finery, these precious stones, over the cup of the sea, the powerful lord, blah, 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 and he died. And what happened? Into Frankish hands, Latin 1210, came the life of that king, and breast garments, the great collar too. Giedish men held that killing field. Really? Is that what it means? Giedish men held that killing field around 1215 or so. What it says is... Geata Leoda Hrawich Helden. Yiddish right. men held that killing field. Problem is, it could also mean the killing field held those Yiddish men. How? They're all dead. Because they are all dead. All but one. And I alone escaped to tell thee, you know. Beowulf is the only one who lives after this battle. Okay? So what the poet has just done is he's gone from, right now we're celebrating Grendel's death, and the poet then jumps into the future and says, in later days, Helak went on this famous journey against the Frisians and he died. And all the Gaetish men died with him. But we're going to find out later on all but one. Then, meanwhile, back at Herod, we go back in time to the present at Herod. The hall swallowed the noise, and wealthy Al stood before the company. So she speaks to Hrothgar slash Beowulf slash Rodolf about Rodolf. She gives Beowulf this, this neck ring that's the most fabulous neck ring ever. Go to the British Museum in London. You'll see all kinds of Celtic neck rings. Some of them are pretty amazing, okay? Or look at them online. And then the poet says, by the way, Helak was wearing that when he died. And then we go back to it, and it's almost like Wealthiel never stopped talking. Almost like she has stopped talking, but now she starts talking again. And she addresses Beowulf. Now remember what I said to hold in your mind about the previous speech. Might she kind of be talking to Beowulf? Beowulf, beloved warrior, wear this neck ring. So we're back to her giving it to him. In good health and enjoy this war garment. Armor. Treasure of a people. Prosper well. Be bold and clever. Next line. And to these boys be mild in counsel. Mild in counsel. Does that mean Beowulf, you know, encourage them, but don't over-encourage them? Train them, but don't over-train them? Spur them, but don't get them, you know, too headstrong? Tell them what they need to survive. Or is it tell them what they need to survive? 
give them the advice they need to live. I will remember you for that. Okay? You have made it so that men will praise you far and near forever and ever. Now that's, that's lasting a long time. Forever and ever. As wide as the seas, home of the winds, surround the shores of earth. She's saying, Baal, because you killed Grindel, you will be known for all eternity on earth. Be to my sons. All right, back up. Be while you live, blessed, O nobleman. Notice she's not saying, and because you're the son of the maker, you're going to live forever. No. While you live, be blessed. I wish you well with these bright treasures. Be to my sons kind in your deeds. Kind. It doesn't only mean nice. It means natural. Appropriate. How? Keeping them in joys. Well, how does he keep them in joys? Keeping them alive. <laughs> well, that would be one way. Keep them alive, Beowulf. Here, and I think she's probably, she might be standing somewhere here, and she goes like this here, making sure to include these three and these two. So everybody here, what? Each earl. Each earl is true to the other, mild in his heart, loyal to his liege lord. The things united, the nation alert, the troop, having drunk at my table, will do as I bid. The troop, this is Hrothgar's men, she says, will do as I bid. That's her way of kind of saying, and you better too. Okay? I, I know here, Hrothgar is true to Hrothgar. Hrothgar is true to Hrothgar. Hrothgar is true to these two. They are earls, but they're Though they're children. And then she goes and sits down. So what has she just told Beowulf to do? Keep an eye on my boys. Why? Well, I know my gracious father. If he remembers all the kindnesses, dot, dot, dot. But if he doesn't. And I'm one of only a few people who read this section this way. This is another one of those areas, you know, I, I posted an idea about this on um, what's called ANSAX. It's an international list of Anglo-Saxon scholars back in the 90s. And you would think I said Beowulf was gay or something. I mean, people from the international Anglo-Saxon community just started shooting everything at me. And about 10 years later, the guy I've mentioned before, Andy Orchard, published his critical companion to Beowulf. And he takes that exact same kind of suggestion here, that this is what she is doing. Okay? So she goes and sits down, the men drink wine, and they did not know weird. What is weird again? Not what is weird, but what is weird? <laughs> what may will. What will be, will be. Well, yeah, they don't know that because it will be. It hasn't happened yet. Also, they're drunk. Well, they will be. <laughs> Again. The cruel fate which would come to pass for many an earl once evening come, came. Really? Did many an earl die? No, nope, only one. So that evening, where did Beowulf sleep? Somewhere else. Why? Grindel's dead. I don't need to sleep here anymore. So he slept in another room. Another place. And Grindel's mother comes. And we were told, fit 19, one paid sorely for his evening rest, as had often happened when Grindel guarded that gold hall, committed his wrongs until he came to his end, died for his sins. Notice, the poet interjects, Grindel died for his sins. This is what's going to happen if you're going to sit down. But an avenger came, Grindel's mother, monstrous woman. Remembered her misery, she who dwelt in those dreadful waters, the cold streams, ever since Cain killed with his blade his only brother, his father's kin. So does that mean she's as old as Cain? No. It means she's one of the progeny of Cain. From him, Cain, line 1265, 
awoke many a faithful spirit, Grindel among them. Okay? So, we get stuff about Grindel, but his mother, line 1275, 6, his mother, greedy, grim-minded, still wanted to go on her sad journey to avenge her son's death. So, how is she acting? As if she's feuding. She's in a feud, right? Somebody killed her son. Fourfold Germanic ethic. Third part. Duty to avenge your kin. Duty to avenge your kin. She acts entirely in line with Anglo-Saxon law. Okay. Does she have a right to? If she were within the law, yes. <laughs> but she's kind of outside the boundaries of the law. Why? Because she's a monster. First of all, monsters aren't within the law. Okay? We'll talk about that later. Yeah, doesn't she only kill one person? She only kills one, yeah. So, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, not a thousand eyes for one eye, which is kind of what Grindel's been doing. But Grindel didn't have a reason to feud against Hrothgar's men, according to what the poem tells us. Okay? So, the next morning... We're told, Hrothgar goes to his hall and finds one man missing, presumed dead. 1305, then the, 06, then the wise old king, gray-bearded warrior, was grieved at heart when he learned that he no longer lived, the dearest of men, his chief bane was dead. So they bring Beowulf, and Beowulf essentially is like, what's up, Hrothgar, how's things going? Ask not of joys, 1322. Sorrow is renewed for the Danish people. Ashera is dead, elder brother Irminloff, my confidant, my counselor, my shoulder companion. When we defended our heads, when the foot soldiers clasped, blah, blah, blah. Notice, by the way, we get one of the indications of what that metaphor actually means of standing shoulder to shoulder. We still hear it today. When 9-11 when happened, you heard Tony Blair and various other you know, world leaders say, we stand shoulder to shoulder with the United States. Yeah, well, that shoulder to shoulder had a pretty big gap between it. You couldn't have a gap in this time period. This is talking about the idea of a shield wall, okay, where arms are interlocked. So one tries to leave. <clears throat> so Asherah was his closest confidant counselor in stood in the shield wall with him. She avenged that feud, Hrothgar says, 1332, or 3, in which you killed Grendel yesterday evening. What has Hrothgar just done? This is your fault. This is your fault, Beowulf. You started a feud with her. Now what should Beowulf do? Not my problem. Yeah, really. I would say after a few choice words and maybe smacking him around a little bit. Because now what does Beowulf hear? 1345, Hrothgar continues. I have heard countrymen and hall counselors among my people report this. They have seen two such creatures. Now what should Beowulf say at that point? Whoa, 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 I've only heard about one. You didn't tell me there were two. The second of them in the shape of a woman. The other misshapen, etc., etc., called Grindel. They knew no father, whether before him had been begotten any more mysterious breeds, blah, blah, blah. So he said, then we even know where he lived. Okay? It's not hard. It's not far. Go on, we can go. I'll take you. It is not far hence, 1361, measured in miles that the mere stands. Over it hangs a grove, hoar-frosted, a firm-rooted wood looming over the water. Interestingly, the description we get of the Grindel's lair and the entrance to it matches perfectly in the Visio St. Pauli, and I think it's Blickling Homily. You might even have a footnote here. No, it doesn't. I think it's Blickling Homily number 17. Blickling is the name of the house. 
that has a library that the manuscript is at. In the vision of St. Paul, in the Blickling Homily 17, in this passage in Beowulf, you get a description of the entrance. Well, not in this passage in Beowulf, but in the other. A description of the entrance into hell. In these two, it's described. This is the entry to hell. Okay? You have a similar description in the Odyssey, entrance to the underworld. You've got a similar description in part of Dante's Divine Comedy. Okay? So, he finishes his little speech, Hrothgar, 1377. 76. Now, once again, all help depends on you alone. This is kind of Hrothgar's, help me, only one can help me. You're the only one who can help me. You do not yet know this fearful place where you might find the sinful creature. Seek it if you dare. He's a monster killer. He can't not take a dare. I will reward you with ancient riches for that feud as I did before if you return alive. Sorrow not, wise one. Now put that in modern language. Suck it up, buttercup. That's what he's telling them. Quit crying. It is always better to avenge one friend than to mourn, period, no. over much. Over much. It's okay to mourn. But you're overdoing it, Hrothgar. Each of us must await the end of this world's life. Meaning, we all die. Get used to it. Let him who can bring about fame before death. That is best for the unliving man after he is gone. We all die. How can you go on living if people know you lived? Period. Fame, reputation. So he says, come on, let's go. The old man leapt up, thanked the Lord, the mighty God, for that man's speech. Okay? So they make their way to Grindel's mirror. And on their way there, 1317, they come around a little bend in the road, and there's a, like a cliffside, and what do they see? 1420, on the sea cliff they came upon the head of Asherah. So they come around a turn, and there, sitting like on a ledge of the cliff, is Asherah's head, staring at them. What does this tell us about Grendel's mother? She's brutal. It's a warning. It's a warning? She's brutal. She's brutal? It's a taunt? Have you ever seen, um, oh, what, what is it? Stupid film. It's an animated, not animated, it's a, like Pixar. <sighs> I can't remember. Um, all I can see is the scene where the guy shows up, and I can't even remember who the actor is. But it's on, oh, I hate it when this happens. What happens? Um. Metro City, yeah, yeah, Metrocity, and... Metrocity, uh, Megamind. Megamind, Megamind. It's the scene, you know, when Megamind comes, he's up in the sky and stuff, and got all the things, and what's he say? What's the difference between him and the other little villain? Not performance. Close, though. Presentation. He knows how to work a crowd. Okay? She's a man. This is top-notch chef stuff. You make the food look just absolutely gorgeous, even though there's not enough to feed a dead squirrel you know, on the plate. So they see that. It freaks them out, right? They get there. They see sea serpents in the water. Some of the men shoot them. We're told this, thing, this place is so bad that a stag being chased by hounds would rather face the bloodthirsty hounds than jump into this water. Okay? So, Beowulf says to Edgedale, fit 22. Okay, now let's just, re let's just kind of go back over what we discussed before. Everything you gave me, if I don't come back, it goes to Helak. 
you, you gave it to me, but it's not really mine. It's Eli's. So don't scrimp. Don't try to keep some. My men get to go back, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And you and Ferris can have my sword. Whoa. It's pretty magnanimous of Beowulf. Has Unferth apologized? Have we seen him kind of so? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Beowulf, Beowulf, you're the best. Woo. Hasn't done that. Okay. I'll take hunting. Why? Because Unferth offered his own sword. We're told. 1455 and following. I'm backing up a little bit. He gave his sword, unique among treasures, etched with poison stripes. It's talking about how it was made. It's not literally etched with poison. Okay? This is indicating that it is a pattern welded sword. Look it up online. Pretty cool. There are people today who still make pattern welded swords. So when you get a whole bunch of rods of steel or iron, you heat them up and you twist them. Don't break. You twist. And then you pound them flat. And then you twist them again, okay? And what you end up with is a sword that looks like it has lines running all up and down it, all right? Pretty cool. He gives this to Beowulf. What might be a problem with this sword? Was it wielded by a king's He could have done it. It could have been the sword that killed his own kin. Not the most auspicious weapon to take into kill a descendant of a kinslayer. But he takes it. And we're told, 1492, after these words, the weather gate did what? He hastened boldly. Now, notice the difference between this battle and the battle with Grindel. In this battle, what did Beowulf do? Unarmed. That's the one with Grindel. He fights with the sword. And what else? The sword armor. He arms up, man. Toe to head. He puts on all the armor. And then jumps into a lake. <laughs> and we're told... It takes a whole day for him to reach the ball. 1494. The surging sea received the brave soldier. It was the space of a day, line 1495, before he could perceive the bottom. The old English is Tha was wheel dies. Tha was H W I L wheel. Guys, literally, it was a time of the day. And the way that gets that kind of language gets translated in other poems, it means it was the greater part. Okay. Nusa says it was the space of a day, or it was daylight. That is asinine. And again, I think Lewis is the best translator there is of Beowulf. But he's bought into Fred Robinson in Bruce Mitchell's translation of the poem, okay? And I think it was Robinson who suggested that the poet here is merely being hyperbolic. He's exaggerating because, I mean, we all know. It can't take you the greater part of a day to come from the top of a lake to the bottom of a lake and you still live. Because the greater part of a day implies bare minimum what? Six hours? Twelve hours and one minute? If you consider day 24 hours. Or the opposite way of reading this or interpreting this is it shows us what about Beowulf? He's in human. He's not from around these parts. He's not like the rest of us. So he jumps in. And it's like the minute he hits that water, she who held that expanse of water, bloodthirsty and fierce for a hundred half years, she ruled that lake for 50 years. Did what? Perceived that some man entered. 
it's like she's got trip wires all over it. He hits the water, beep, 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 the alarms go off, right? So what happened? She swims up, he's swimming down, she grabs him, she snatches him off to her cave. Underground air pocket in the cave. And look at this description. 1512b. Then the Earl perceived that he was in some sort of battle hall where no water could harm him in any way. And for the hall's roof, he could not be reached by the flood's sudden rush. And he saw a firelight, a glowing blaze shining brightly. So he arrives in Grindel's mother's hall, and it's like, it's, it's what? It's home. She's got a fire burning in the fireplace. What are we going to discover later on? She's got hoards of treasure. She's got decorations, in fact. Because one of them is sticking on the wall. Like you go into some people's homes and there's a shotgun up over the mantle. It's her version of a shotgun. So, he sees her, gives her a mighty blow, 1520, with the sword. He did not temper that stroke. That is, he doesn't hold back. Two hands, 30, 30, 60, Hits her. What happens to the sword? Shatters like glass. Okay. Again, 1529, he was stalwart, not slow of zeal. And he throws away the board, blade, and what does he think? He trusts in his strength. The might of his hand grip. As a man should do if by his warfare he thinks to win. If it really comes down to it, you kill him with your bare finger. So, he swings her, she falls to the ground, 1540. She quickly gives him requital, and here we have what I think is a line of Anglo-Saxon humor, though it falls on deaf ears today. She gave him requital for that with a grim grasp, grappled him to her. Weary he stumbled, strongest of warriors, of foot soldiers, and took a fall. Strongest of foot soldiers. He's like Muhammad Ali, who used to sting like a bumblebee and dance like a butterfly, or sting like a whatever. Fly like a butterfly. Fly like a butterfly and sting like a bee. When he do his rope a What are we being told? Beowulf is the greatest warrior there is on his feet. And what happens? She trips him. So if she trips him, how good is he? And in fact, it's not just that she trips him. What does she do next? The Old English, 1545. 1545. Offsat Thothona Seligist. Then she sat on that hall guest. It's not she sat upon. Right? Then she went at him hammer and tongs. The Old English says, he's on the ground. She plops down on him, pulls out her little knife, and goes all, uh, you know, tries to kill him. But he's wearing Waylon the Smith's war coat. And we're told, 1550, there the son of Edgedale would have ended his life under the wide ground, the Gaines champion, had not his armored shirt offered him help. The hard, bar, hard, blah, hard battle net. And it's not just the shirt. Holy God brought about war victory. The wise Lord, ruler of the heavens, decided it rightly, easily. Once he stood up again. The word that's translated once there is Sidon. It can be translated once or it can be translated because. Now, there's a huge difference between once and because. This one indicates causality. This one just indicates time. All right? So, one holy... Thing, it sounds like he was always going to... Okay. Battle, but because it's like, because he stood up. He so, who gets the credit? Holy God brought about war victory. The wise Lord, ruler of the heavens, decided it readily, easily... Because he stood up again? That is, we're ascribing this to God because Beowulf got up again? 
or are we ascribing it to God once Beowulf got up again? And what does he see? He saw among the armor, a victorious blade, ancient giant sword, strong in its edge, best of weapons, greater than any man might lift. And what does he do? He grabs its hilt, he draws it, and it's like in one swing. So where does he see it? He's going to tell us later. Hanging on the wall. Where else have we seen a sword on a wall? Sigamund, when he kills the dragon. He struck the dragon so fiercely, he stuck the sword in the wall. Okay? So we have two instances where we have a sword in slash on a wall. Here's a question I've had for a long time, and I don't think anybody has addressed this. Might this be the same sword? Might this be the sword that killed the dragon that Sigamund used? What would that do to Beowulf's reputation? I mean, he used the dragon killer sword. Okay, so cuts her, kills her. The flames gleam, that is, wherever the flames are, once she's dead, whoosh, like somebody threw phosphorus on him. He looks around. And what does he see? All kinds of treasure. He finds Grendel's body. And what does he do? 1584. He paid him back for that. The fierce champion for on a couch. On a couch? So, got a fire, got a couch over here, nice little divan over here, lazy boy. What is this showing us about the Grindel kin, the Grindel family? They're actually pretty civilized. They have their own life. It's, 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 I understand what you mean by civilized, but they have their own kind of social customs. They have their own way of, they're not animals, yeah. in other words. Okay? What does he do to Grindel? Lops his head off so that the body sprang forth. Why? Well, what happens to roadkill after it's been on the road for a couple days? Gas builds up. You hit the gas. Or you hit the body. It blows up. Okay? So, meanwhile, back at the top of the mirror, the troops see the water bubbling. And it's bubbling with blood and hot gore. And they're like, sucks to be Beowulf. <laughs> <laughs> see you geeks later, and we're heading back home. And we're told, line 1600, the ninth hour came. It's simply tha com non dies. Interestingly, Germanic people did not reckon time by this language. The ninth hour came. What kind of language is that? It's biblical reckoning of time. First hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, twelfth hour. And then the early Christians adopt that biblical time and they add to it. Because David said in the Psalms, I, seven times a day will I pray to you. Okay? So that you get those and then you get later hours of prayer. Okay? So ninth hour corresponds to what? If I remember right, it's noon. Okay? What happened at the ninth hour? No, it's not noon. It's 3, 3 p.m. That's when Christ died. He was crucified in the sixth hour. Sky went dark. And the ninth hour is when he said, Into thy hands I commit my spirit. <laughs> Dead. Ninth hour came. And the noble shieldings do what? They went home. Why? Dead. The poet is using pretty specific Christian symbolism here. Meanwhile, the guests, who are the guests? The geats. They sit sad at heart. Why? 
they're like the disciples sitting way off in the distance away from the crucifixion because they don't want to be anywhere near Jesus seeing what happens. They look in the mirror. They wished but did not hope that they would see their Lord again. They wished it would be really nice, but they had no hope. Why? Blood and gore, you know, bubbling up. Meanwhile, back down at the bottom of the lake, the sword starts to melt. Right? So, Beowulf takes the sword, hilt, stuffs it in his belt, we assume, grabs Grindel's head, comes out to the opening of the cave, and swims back up. And his men are surprised to see him. The defender of seafarers, 1623, came to land, swam stout-hearted. He rejoiced in his sea booty. The troop of thanes come to him. They thank God. They help him take off his armor and stuff. And then they go forth. They make their way to Herod. Who carries Grindel's head? Four men. Okay. Each with a battle pole, like a spear. What's this telling us about the size of Grendel's head? Notice Beowulf can carry it by himself, but it takes four men to. And they've got their spears. How, how are their spears, how are they carrying it? I mean, are they carrying it over their shoulders like this, and the head is sitting on it? It's like they're carrying a, it's like a head on a pike, right? Yeah, that's what I think it is. They've got their spear points shoved up through the neck into the brain of the head. And they're each carrying it like this. If you've ever been a pallbearer at a funeral, okay, you're carrying the coffin, either six, sometimes eight of you. So it takes four men to carry this head. How big is this head? Well, four men can easily, I mean, one man can easily carry 100 pounds, so is this a 400-pound head? <laughs> it's huge, okay? So they carry it like this until they get to the hall, and then what do they do? They take it off the poles, grab it by the little bit of hair it has, and they drag it down the center of Herod's floor. Okay. Dragging it by the hair, so what's on the floor? A lot of blood. The open neck part, and it's dragging, and it's going across the rough pavement, and it's bouncing, and every time it bounces, you <laughs> Stuff jiggles out. So there's now gray matter and blood. Because we're told. Then, 1647, where men were drinking, they dragged by its hair, Grindel's head across the hall floor, a grisly spectacle for men and the queen. And Baal says, look! <laughs> I brought you gladly these gifts from the sea, which you gaze on here, a token of glory. Not easily did I escape with my life. And indeed I would have died if God had not guarded me. Nor, sorry, Unferth, lovely weapon, no good for me. Okay? But the ruler of men granted to me that I might see on the wall a gigantic old sword hanging, glittering. Hanging, like it's got, you know, Little hangers mounted on the wall. What's that telling us about the sword? It's a trophy. It's a trophy. It's a decoration. Which does what to the Grindel kid? Even more. It humanizes them. Okay? So he takes the hilt. He puts it in Hrothgar's hand. You don't have time for me to do this part. I'll start it. <laughs> and he takes it. And we're told, one, we've been told this twice now, it's the old work of giants. Whenever Anglo-Saxons came across some, some, something they couldn't explain, like Stonehenge, or the city of Bath, with its stone buildings and pump houses and everything, because they couldn't explain it, old work of giants. Giants must have made that. How else do you get those rocks where they are? Okay? The men can't do that. And what does he do? Hrothgar looks at it. He studied the hilt of the old heirloom where was written the origin of ancient strife. 
When the flood slew the rushing seas, the race of giants. Now, awful lot of scholars have said the flood that's referred to here, Noah's flood. And it might be. But there's also another flood that slew a race of giants. And that's a Norse flood. That's a Germanic flood. Okay? It could be both. There was a people alien. That was a people alien to the eternal Lord. That is giants, etc., etc. And he sees marked in runic letters who the sword was made for. But the poet doesn't tell us. Would have been nice if the poet had said, we have Anglo-Saxon swords that have written on them. Made for Everwich. Made for Alfred, etc. And so Hrothgar starts what is called his homily. It's called his homily, his sermon. Begins line 1700 and goes all the way through. Seventeen eighty four. And he says, One may indeed say, if he acts in truth and right for the people, that this earl was born a better man. It's kind of thoughts here going, Way to go, Beowulf. (laughs) Beowulf, my friend, your glory is exalted throughout the world, over every people. You hold it all with patient care and temper strength with wisdom. Not great strength and no one to use us. Strength, fortitudo, with wisdom. Sapienti. Okay? There's a famous article written in the 60s called Fortitudo et Sapienti as a controlling theme of Beowulf by a guy named R.E. Caskey. Okay? Strength and wisdom. Rothgar just said, Beowulf, you temper this with this. See, Hrothgar has some strength, or excuse me, has some wisdom, but he doesn't have any strength. Haramod had strength, but he didn't have any wisdom. Helek has strength, but he sure as you know what doesn't have any wisdom. Okay? So, you got it all, Beowulf. You're the whole deal. He says, yeah, I'll fulfill what I said earlier. You shall become a comfort everlasting to your own people, help to heroes. Not so was Haramod. Now, who's Haramod again? He's the model of what? Bad king. Bad king. So you're going to be a great comfort. There's that word again. A great solace to your people. Haramod wasn't. What happened? In rage, 1713, he cut down his table companions, comrades in arms, until he turned away alone from the pleasures of men. Why? Because when he killed his own men at the table, everybody else turned against him. And he had to flee. No rings did he give to the Danes for their honor. Therefore, he endured joyless to suffer the pains of that strife, a long-lasting harm to his people. Learn from him, Beowulf. Understand virtue. For your sake, I'm telling you, this in the wisdom of my winters. Because he's going to tell us in a moment how long he has reigned. And he would talk like that. He's not young. He's not in his 40s or 50s or 60s. Okay? Um, yeah, we'll stop there. And I will put up for you... Hopefully something that begins somewhere around 1724, because I'm pretty sure I've had to stop in that exact place before. I really don't want to do that, though.